Good day. Sometime after I made my uh, video yesterday, an uh, official announcement came from the Russian Ministry of Defense, which confirmed or, or, or said that the Russian forces in the Balaklaya Izium area were being redeployed to the area of, Don, of the Donetsk People's Republic to facilitate the work of the special military operation there. The Ministry of Defence statement went on to say that this redeployment had been carried out over a period of 72 hours. It intimated that the redeployment had been successful and it also said that there'd been a successful deception operation um, which had confused the Ukrainian forces and um, it didn't explain the nature of that deception operation but I'm going to discuss its details in a moment. Lastly, it made claims that the Ukrainian forces which had carried out this offensive in Kharkov region had suffered heavy losses of up to 2,000 men and subsequent comments from the Russian Ministry of Defense said that 4,000 Ukrainian troops had been killed over the previous uh, couple of days from the 6th of September onwards in fighting in Kherson region and in Kharkov region. Now, I get to discuss this comment, this is this extraordinary statement from the Russian Ministry, Ministry of Defense in this program and I'm going to make a number of observations. First of all, there is no doubt at all that the withdrawal from Izium, from Balaklia, from other places, uh, uh, Kupiansk, if I'm pronouncing its frame correctly, has indeed been conducted with great efficiency and thoroughness. So far as I can tell, Russian forces have with, been withdrawn across the Oskol River with minimal losses. Um, I, I obviously don't know, can't say how many Russian, how many losses the Russians have suffered over the course of this withdrawal, but it, all the indications are that they are very few. There's been a video circulating, which I have seen, um, in Ukrainian telegram channels, which purports to show uh, Russian heavy weapons supposedly abandoned in Izium. Most people who've seen this video consider it to be a fake and consider that it probably shows some uh, depot in Crimea of um, broken down Russian equipment mixed up with some Ukrainian trophy equipment. I've seen the video. I agree. So it looks as if the Russians carried out their withdrawal in good order without losing large numbers of men. In fact, it's probable that the Russian losses overall have been insignificant. And I am becoming increasingly inclined to believe Russian claims about Ukrainian losses. So when the Russians say that 2,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed in the Kharkov region, which is a very large total, out of a force of perhaps 15,000 men, which was committed to this offensive. Well, I think that is probably true. And that is a very high percentage of this force. The Ukrainians have suffered heavy losses, um, whereas the Russians, in conducting this withdrawal have suffered minimal losses and I'm going to say now something which may seem speculative but which is based on extensive experience An, a withdrawal carried out so efficiently and so thoroughly is a withdrawal which has been prepared over a long time. I've discussed in recent programs how from a Russian point of view the Izium operation has not been the success 
it might have been expected to be in March. The Isium grouping did not march all the way to Slavyansk. It got bogged down first in clearing the industrial zone of Izium from Ukrainian troops. It then got bogged down in fighting in the so-called Sherwood Forest area. And it has been, it has faced constant Ukrainian attacks on its flanks, on its western flanks, including, by the way, large numbers of attacks precisely in the Balaklaya area where the latest Ukrainian breakthrough has taken place. So you had a significant number of Russian troops standing idle, controlling ground that they weren't, wasn't proving useful, um, absorbing Russian resources, absorbing Russian attention. And it wasn't achieving its original purpose. There's been some suggestions that Izium was an important logistical hub for the Donbass operation. I think that's an widely exaggerated. And it's also been suggested that Izium was an important transport artery and control of it was affecting Ukrainian logistics in Donbass. And to be frank, I've seen absolutely no evidence of that over the last few months. Maybe that was the original Russian plan or belief. Maybe the Russians did believe that if they captured Izium, the Ukrainian force in Donbass would be drained of supplies. But one way or the other, the, the Ukrainians have found other ways of keeping their forces in Donbass supplied. And this plan, if it was a plan, to cut off, to choke off supplies to the Ukrainian forces in Donbass by occupying Izium, that has been a failure. So, given all this, that this, all this is so, I think it is highly likely, in fact, I am quite sure, and the success of the Russian withdrawal across the Oskol River, all of this leads me to think that this is something that the Russians have been considering doing for a very long time. The Izium grouping had no natural defence lines um, on its western flanks, which is why it has been consistently subject to these attacks on its western flank in places like Balaklaya. On the assumption, and it's only an assumption, but on the assumption that the Oskol River line is now the new Russian defence line on their western flank, well, the Oskol River, though it's not a huge river, obviously, does provide them, by, in, by contrast, with a defence line that they can use and which can help them contain Ukrainian attacks uh, um, on the western flanks of their forces in this part of Ukraine. And I strongly suspect that there's been a long-standing debate on the part of the Russian military and political leadership about whether or not to do this thing. And I suspect also, now this is more speculative now, but I suspect that at some point, somebody, probably a couple of weeks ago, took the decision in Moscow that a withdrawal from Izium and Balaklaya and all of these places made some kind of military sense. And very reluctantly, whoever was opposing this decision in Moscow probably gave, eventually probably agreed to this and gave the green light. Now, I, I say that my experience is that any kind of operation of this complexity carried out so thoroughly and so effectively and so successfully must have been based upon pre-arranged pre plans. You don't just make up a withdrawal of this nature on the fly. 
anybody who's worked in a any kind of organization knows that this is the case and that there's been dissension about this on the military polit within the military and political circles in Moscow that I have to say again given my own experience in working in bureaucracies though I don't know this for a fact I think it is almost a given in fact I'm going to make a further guess that the military leaders probably unhappy about their lack of resources in Ukraine, the fact that they don't have enough troops to secure every part of these very extended front lines, that they've been pressing for a withdrawal um, to the east bank of the Oskol River for some time. Um, I, I sh um, whilst I suspect the political side of the leadership, people like Medvedev have been unwilling to do that because of the political effect of this and because also I suspect that they are concerned about the abandonment of many of the people in this part of Kharkov region who have welcomed the arrival of the Russians. So I can imagine that this has been a long-standing discussion within the political and military leadership in Moscow, one which we don't have any direct knowledge of because the Kremlin and the Russian general staff keep their secrets, but I would personally be astonished if this discussion had not been happening for some time. So, in light of this, I think that it's clear that for some time now, the Russians have been quietly thinning their forces in this part of Ukraine, that they've been gradually redeploying forces away from this area and redeploying them elsewhere. And I noticed, by the way, that about a week ago, we saw for the first time information that Russian regular army troops had started to take a role, an active role, in Donbass, in the fighting in Donbass, with units of a Russian regular army division having participated in some of the fighting in Marinka. And I did wonder where those forces had come from. And it's a reasonable guess that they were part of the troops that were being redeployed from Izium. Now, we've got a report now from the New York Times, which confirms that which we have already always known, that there is extensive intelligence cooperation between Ukraine and the United States. The US would undoubtedly have known about the fact that the forces in Asium, the Russian forces, were being drawn down. They would have passed that information on to Ukraine. And I strongly suspect, though I cannot prove, obviously, but I strongly suspect that the Ukrainians decided to launch this offensive in this particular area because they knew that the Russian forces were being drawn down and that there weren't many of them there. And I suspect that this explains some of the nature of this offensive. The Ukrainians were able to send flying columns of lightly armed troops in very small numbers up the various country roads occupying one village after another at lightning speed because they knew that they would not come up against any significant resistance. They knew that the Russian forces that had previously been located in this area were already being withdrawn and that the Russian forces had been drawn down. If there had been large numbers of Russian forces in this area of Izium, Balaklia, as there have been in the past, I ought to say there have been many battles in and around Balaklaya in the past. The Ukrainians have repeatedly launched attacks in this particular area and they've all up to now failed. If there had been large numbers of Russian troops in this area, Russian regular army, the Ukrainians would have known that the Russians would be able to deal with these small groups of Ukrainian soldiers very quickly and they would not have launched an offensive in this way. 
So that was why the Ukrainians decided to launch this attack in this place with a total force numbering no more than 15,000 men and why they were willing to take the risk of sending out these small units to seize villages, to move with lightning speed, 30 kilometers a day or whatever it was. They knew that they would be able to do this against no opposition. And they no doubt gambled that because the Russians had already made the decision to withdraw across the Oskol River, they would not stand and fight. They would not defend places like uh, uh, Izium, Kupiansk, Kupiansk and whatever because a decision had already been made, in effect, to retreat from them. And that, I think, explains both the reason for the offensive and the reason for the Russian withdrawal and the nature of the fighting which has taken place. In fact, there has been very little fighting at all. The Russians say that 2,000 Ukrainian troops have been killed. I think that is probably correct, but they will, they've been killed over the course of this operation, not by getting into battles, firefights with, Ukraine, with Russian forces, not in tank battles or anything of that kind. They have been heavily attacked by Russian artillery, Russian missile formations, Russian aircraft, which have been heavily bombing them, even as they have been trying to drive forwards without air cover again, against uh, uh, over, over territory, not as open territory as that in Kherson region, but nonetheless, they've appeared on open ground, where they've, of course, made attractive targets for the Russian Air Force. Now, saying it in this way, you might come away with the view that I think that this has been some sort of success for the Russians. They've carried out their retreat against the, across the Oskol River, which is probably what the military always wanted to do. They've had They've, uh, they've had minimal losses. They redeployed along the Oskol River at the moment. I mean, we don't know the Russian military's plans, but for the moment, that does appear to be the defence line. Over the last couple of hours, there's been no news of any successful Ukrainian breakthroughs across the Oskol River. And the effect has been that this is... this. Redeployment has been carried out successfully and the Ukrainians, for their part, have suffered very heavy losses. Well, you could say, and maybe if you're a general staff officer in Moscow, you will say that this has been, overall, a success. I have to say straight away that I absolutely do not agree with that view. I think that this has been, on the contrary, a debacle. And I think this is the point now where I have to explain why I think that. And I'm going to come back to that Ministry of Defence statement. Note that the Ministry of Defence said that there'd been a successful deception operation carried out. I've no doubt that that is so. We had all those films from the Russian Ministry of Defence itself showing us what appeared to be motorised and armoured columns of Russian forces rushing to reinforce the Russian troops who were holding their positions in places like Izium, Kupiansk and all the rest. And lots of people were fooled by this. And there are strong reasons to believe that the Ukrainians themselves were fooled by this. We saw that in the run-up to the Russian evacuation across the Oskol River, which took place at night, that the Ukrainians pulled their punches, they didn't press their attacks on the withdrawing Russian forces, and that it's highly likely 
that one of the reasons they did that, in fact, it's not highly likely, we know for a fact that one of the reasons they did that, they, they didn't do that, was because they were worried that the Russians weren't going to retreat after all, that they were going to actually hold their positions and that they were going to reverse the decision to, um, to withdraw from this area and that they were going to make a fight for it after all. And as a result, that caused a certain degree of disorganization and confusion on the part of the Ukrainians, which at a critical moment blunted their advance. Well, that makes a kind of logical sense, but it is important to say that it was not just the Russians, not just the Ukrainians, who were deceived by this deception operation. Lots of other people were deceived. I was deceived. I saw all this film, some of which, as I said, has been published by the Ministry of Defence, the Russian Ministry of Defence itself, on its own website. I believed all these pictures of all these convoys of troops trundling along supposedly to the rescue. I assumed that they were true. By the way, I now suspect that some of these rumours that we were getting, which uh, about, you know, Russian troop movements around the Moscow Ring Road, uh, moving ultimately towards this area of Kharkov region to reinforce the troops there, even though it would have taken them many days to get there. I rather think that what was actually happening is that all those, all that film of Russian convoys that we were seeing was actually probably filmed on the Moscow Ring Road and then uploaded onto the Ministry of Defence website as part of the deception operation. Well, I was fooled by it. Well, I don't really matter though, because I'm just a commentator describing the whole situation in London. Lots of people on the ground in places like Bakalia, Izium, Kupiansk, Shevchenko, all of these places that are now being occupied by the Ukrainians, will have been fooled by it themselves. The Russian people, those who take an interest in the war, which who are a large proportion of the Russian population, they were fooled by it too. So, of course, were all these journalists, telegram bloggers, all of those sort of people as well. They were deceived. They were led to think that the Russian army was going to stand and fight. And, of course, in reality, it wasn't doing so. And understandably, not they, they at the moment feel deeply betrayed and very, very angry. And it's not difficult to understand their anger because of course the Russian army has withdrawn. It's abandoned large amounts of territory to the Ukrainians without a shot being fired by the Russians to defend it. Well, that's an exaggeration. There have been many shots fired. But anyway, it's been abandoned, effectively, essentially without a battle. Some of this territory had been very difficult to capture. It had taken long weeks, for example, to clear Izium of the Ukrainian defenders. So there is understandable anger and the fact that the Ministry of Defence has talked about a deception operation, makes these people feel played. And of course, a lot of people who lived in these places, in Bakalia, in uh, Izium, and all of the rest, who might have decided to leave if they'd been told weeks ago or months ago that the Russians weren't going to stay there, that they were going to withdraw, if a proper evacuation of civilians had been organized well, they're going to feel even more de de deceived and betrayed now because right up to the very last moment, the Russians were giving them to think that they were going to stand and fight. So this has been a disaster. And this compounds the disastrous optics of this affair because ultimately, Whatever explanation you have for this move, one can't get away from the fundamental truth 
that if the Russians decided that they needed to redeploy forces from Izium to Donbass, it's because they didn't have enough forces everywhere across the whole of Ukraine. Now, I am going to discuss that in a moment. But, of course, we have been hearing for weeks, for months, going all the way back to the start of the special operation, that the Russians haven't committed enough troops to see it through. And these events have massively, and with good reason, reinforced that narrative. And to compound that, it's not as if the military resources to see this thing through are not there. There is already a narrative, which I have seen on some Russian telegram channels, saying that one of the reasons there weren't enough troops in Donbass, in Ukraine, to finish the war, is because troops are being used for other less important purposes. And there is already talk that some of the troops who were participating in the Vostok exercises in the Far East, where 50,000 Russian troops are deployed, that some of these troops had been sent there from Ukraine. I don't know whether that is true or not. I doubt it very much, actually, just as I actually doubt the claims that troops from Izium had been redeployed to defend Kherson region. I've seen no evidence of this. But it's not surprising, it's not difficult to understand why these claims are now being made and why they're being given credence. And even if it's not true that Russian troops were deployed from Izium region to Kherson region in Ukraine or, or, or to uh, the Far East to participate in the Vostok exercises. It's completely unsurprising that a lot of people are saying in Russia, well, why, why did we have these exercises in the Far East when these troops could have played a much more useful role in eastern Ukraine, holding on to Izium region, defending our forces there? Now, my own view is that the real problem is not that there aren't enough Russian forces to con complete this operation. I mean, the British Ministry of Defence constantly says that, you know, 80% of the Russian army is being committed to the, the war in Ukraine. That is manifestly not the case. I come back to what I've been saying over the last couple of programmes. I think the problem is in the nature of the special military operation itself. The fact that when it was authorised back in February, it was intended to provide support to the militia in the Donbass. And that has meant that it is the militia that's been doing most of the ground fighting, in fact nearly all the ground fighting in Donbass, supplemented by Chechen forces and the Wagner group, but without the Russian regular army directly participating in most of the ground fighting. And here, by the way, I'm just going to make one observation amongst many of the commentators who have been conducting this war, uh, uh, describing this war, and by the way, to a great extent, that includes myself. Whenever the Russians have captured, or whenever there's been a capture of a place like, say, Severodonetsk, I've spoken about the Russians capturing Severodonetsk. And when you hear discussions about the fighting in Donbass from, say, people like the Military Summary Channel, one of the things I've noticed about the Military Summary Channel is that, very understandably, they draw a lot of their information from the bulletins published every day by the Russian military of defense, Ministry of Defense. And that gives us a very good picture of the Ukrainian military formations that have been attacked, the various Ukrainian military brigades that have been attacked in Donbass. But 
there's never the same amount of information. In fact, there's almost no information about who is fighting these Ukrainian milit minist uh, uh, formations, military formations, these Ukrainian brigades on what you might call the Russian side. You don't get discussions that, you know, the ex-Russian brigade is located here, ex-Russian brigade is located there in Donbass. And this lack of information about who is doing the fighting on the Russian side has obscured something that has only gradually become clear to me, basically from reading Reba reports, that in fact it's almost entirely the militia that's been doing the fighting in Donbass. Now, that comes back to my discussion about the militia. Hodakovsky, who is one of the best and toughest militia commanders and one of the most experienced, somebody who has a um, history of fighting in this conflict going all the way back to 2014, he has explained a lot about the nature of the militia over the last few days. And he says that just like the Russian armed forces are essentially divided into two groups, the ground forces that are responsible to the Russian Ministry of Defense, who are the Russian armored and mechanized infantry and the airborne forces, the Russian regular army in other words, but alongside them, we have the internal security troops of the Roskvadia organization who do not have that kind of combat role. So the militia is divided in the same way. There are the tough, regular forces like, his, like uh, um, Khodorkovsky's own Vostok Brigade who are trained and equipped up to the level of regular army. And then we have the many other units made up of reservists whose primary function is to carry out an internal security role. What that means is that the militia itself doesn't have vast numbers of forces that it can call on in Donbass. And that's one of the reasons why the advance in Donbass has been so incremental and why it has had to be conducted with such massive artillery preparation. Obviously there are other reasons too, the need to break Ukrainian defences, to um, smash Ukrainian pillboxes and bunkers and all that sort of thing. But ultimately there is a shortage of infantry and the reason there is a shortage of infantry is because the nature of the special military operation up to this point is that it is Russia supporting the two Donbass republics as they work to liberate their territory from Ukraine. And that has given the Donbass militia a disproportionately large role in the fighting. It should be said straight away that when they do fight, these organizations like the Vostok Brigade, the Somalia Brigade, all of these others, they fight outstandingly well. But there isn't, there aren't large numbers of them. So this is explains, this explains the very incremental nature of the fighting. Why village by village has to be taken, why cities like Bakhmut have to be isolated and supply lines cut before an attempt is made to storm these places. Now that's all very well if you have an indefinite amount of time on your hands, but it does open the way for Ukrainian attacks like the one we've seen in Kharkiv. And the reason that happens is because since the Russian army is playing only a supportive role in the war in Ukraine, 
most of it has been drawn down. There simply are large numbers of Russian troops in this part of Ukraine. To the extent that there is Russian regular army deployed in Ukraine, it's been deployed in areas of critical importance like Kherson region, where they have proved outstandingly effective in countering Ukrainian, the Ukrainian counteroffensive counter -offensive that's taken place there, and in places like Zaporozhye, and I strongly suspect in southern Donbass, where which we will come to in a moment. But up to this point in time, they've not fulfilled much of an offensive role. They've fulfilled instead a supportive role. They were doing the same in Izium. They were, since this idea of advancing south towards Slavyansk was abandoned, they've only been left there to stand their ground, protecting Kharkov region, protecting Izium itself, but not taking much of an active role in the offensive fighting. Now, that opens up possibilities for Ukraine to launch attacks like the one we've seen in Kharkiv. Now, where is all this going to lead to? I spoke yesterday in my programme about the need for Putin and his officials to start to revisit this strategy and to start asking themselves whether they really do have an indefinite amount of time on their hands. Maybe they do. Um, Adam Toos, the economic historian, has, for example, written a very powerful and very interesting article in which he has supported the point which I've been making in several programmes that Ukraine is on the brink of economic collapse. Adam Tooze, by the way, is very supportive of Ukraine. And he's been making the point that Ukraine is running a deficit of $7 billion a month. And it's been only getting financial support from the West to the extent of $1.5 billion a month. It is printing money to cover the difference and on the brink of winter with the economy likely to go on contracting and with a supply chain crisis that really risks well he doesn't quite say what it risks but hyperinflation is I would have thought a very real danger now so perhaps the economic crisis in Europe, the economic crisis in Ukraine, perhaps that will play out to Russia's advantage in the medium to long term. But allowing things to continue along this pace in Donbass, allowing the fighting in Donbass to be run entirely by the militia, supplemented by Chechen forces and by people, by organisations like the Wagner Force, does give Ukraine the initiative in other places. We've seen the Ukrainians try an offensive in Kherson region, it failed disastrously. We've seen the Ukrainians carry out a successful offensive in Kharkiv region. Maybe that offensive was launched against Kharkiv region because, as I speculated at the start of this program, the Ukrainians were tipped off that the Russians were intending to pull out of Kharkiv region. But as I said, the optics of that counteroffensive, of that offensive, have been entirely beneficial to Ukraine, entirely disastrous to Russia. We're now hearing reports that the Ukrainians are now gathering forces in Ugladar, in southern Donbass, and that they might be thinking of starting an offensive there as well. I'm confident that the Russians will parry this. I suspect that they will not want a successful offensive by Ukraine in Donbass itself. And Ugladar is, of course, in Donbass. But it's never a good thing thing to be on the defensive in in all sorts of places 
and to have to parry Ukrainian moves in Kherson, in Ugladar, possibly in Kharkiv, whilst your own offensive is grinding on at this very slow and steady pace. Now, possibly the decision to redeploy forces from, from Izium and Balaklia to Donbass does mean that we will start to see a more proactive role by the Russian regular army in Donbass. The Russians have signalled that they expect to conduct referendums in Donbass and in Kherson region and in that part of Zaporozhye that they control on the 4th of November. I noticed previously, by the way, that there seem to be no plans to conduct similar referendums in Kharkiv region, where this Ukrainian offensive has just taken place. And that, by the way, reinforces my belief that the Russians had already made a decision beforehand, before this offensive was launched, to pull back from this area. But anyway, if they really are planning to launch these referendums in Donbass, in Kherson region, in Zaporozhye, by the 4th of November, then logically they must sort out the problems in Donbass by that date. And redeploying and committing the Russian regular army to that purpose in Donbass logically is the way to do it. It doesn't make any other sense because otherwise this operation is probably going to go on longer still or at least it risks going on for longer still. And as I said, in the meantime, what that means is that the Russians are fighting effectively on the defensive everywhere else. Does that mean that the Russians need to redeploy more troops to Ukraine? Well, I've never really discussed this before. It's not really my province. I'm not a military expert. I don't even know how many Russian troops that actually are in Ukraine at the moment. Nobody has ever come up with an actual figure. As I said, we don't even know what military formations are there, except that we have identities of certain airborne divisions which have been fighting mainly in Kherson region. But other than that, we just don't actually have a clear picture of which Russian military formations are in Ukraine. So I don't know how many Russian troops are actually there. But I can't personally see how deploying more troops to Ukraine it can do any possible harm, always assuming that the Russians really do have an insufficiency of troops there. And besides, why not? Why not? bring in more troops. As I said, if you've got 50,000 troops to conduct exercises in the Far East, then why not redeploy some of those 50,000 troops to Donbass when they can make a real difference? We will see what the Russian leadership does. Now, I'm going to say this. For the first time in this war, criticism of the Russian leadership is mounting. I don't follow Russian television, but I understand that Russian talk shows are now full of criticism, or at least implicit criticism. Telegram channels are full of this. You can even see this in official places like the TASS news agency. The very fact that they're having to respond to criticism shows that this criticism is there. And these things can become cumulative and they, they can start to gather force. If Ukraine were to succeed in launching a successful offensive 
or what he could pass off as a successful offensive in Ugleda, for example, it's very easy to see how there could be a crisis of confidence in Russia. How the Russians, the Russian leadership, could be faced with the same sort of political crisis or loss of confidence or collapse of confidence that the United States faced during the Vietnam War at the time of North Vietnam's Tet Offensive in 1968, for example. It's far better to avoid that happening and to take decisive action to prevent it happening and to do so now. Alternatively, perhaps if the Russians stick to their present plans and let things get out of hand, then always assuming that Ukraine gets through this economic crisis, maybe the Russians might want to consider whether in fact all their brave words about dictating terms on Ukraine, liberating Donbass, whether that is even practical. If they're not prepared to do what they have to do, which is well within their power, to bring the situation under control, then they might as well revisit the question of whether it was wise to launch this special military operation at all and to draw the consequences from that and to perhaps ask serious questions about the nature of their political leadership. Now, I've never discussed things in this way up to now in these programmes, but I have to say that my programme yesterday, in which I said that Ukraine had clearly won a victory and Russia had clearly suffered a defeat in Kharkiv, remains true, unequivocally true, even if it had always been the Russian intention to withdraw from this area of Kharkiv region, as I strongly believe it was. And that disastrous Ministry of Defence statement essentially telling not just the Ukrainians, but the Russian people and the people of Kharkiv region that they had been fooled and deceived, as well as the Ukrainians, well, that's compounded it. Let me finish once more by repeating that quotation from Napoleon, who did know something about war. In war, the moral is to the physical as three is to one. If the Russians win every battle, but don't win the political conflict in Ukraine, if they continue to make mistakes of the kind that they just made in Kharkiv region, if they act towards their own people and the people in Ukraine with the same cynicism that that Ministry of Defence statement shows, then whatever battles they win in Ukraine, they will eventually suffer a political defeat. And the sooner they understand that, the better for them it will be. Well, that's me for the day. We'll see whether there is a Ukrainian offensive in Ugladar. I suspect there will be. I suspect the Russians will counter it. I think the Russian forces in that area are much stronger than they were in Kharkiv region. And to be straightforward about it, I think retreat there is not an option. So we will see all of we will see how things uh, work out. And in the meantime, I would simply say, again, if you want to follow all my videos, you can do it by going to our various other platforms, Locals, Rumble, um, um, BitChute, Odyssey and Telegram. You find links under this video. You can support us um, by Patreon with by Patreon and subscribe star and of course don't forget to go to our shop to buy the amazing things that you will find there our hats or hoodies or sweatshirts or t-shirts all those other things and of course if you've liked this video which perhaps some of you may not like some of the things I've said but I think it's 
necessary to say them straightforwardly. But anyway, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon and have a very good day until then.